everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this Friday night for our Caltech Astronomy Stargazing Lecture. Um, it's, it's, it's a very exciting lecture on a really um, interesting topic that has been getting a lot of press in the news in the last five or so years. So I'm, I'm glad you could, you could join us tonight. Um, I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm a computational astrophysicist here at Caltech, and I will be the MC for this evening's event. So thank you, thank you for joining us. Um, just a few quick announcements over the next couple of minutes before I introduce our speaker, Dr. Saul Tokolsky, who will be talking about gravitation and gravitational waves and general relativity and Einstein. Um, so this is part of our our monthly scheduled uh, public lectures that, that take place uh, once one Friday a month at seven o'clock p.m. in the Pacific time. And the lectures are about 30 minutes long and then they're followed by a Q&A panel. So what will happen tonight is I'll introduce Saul, he'll give a presentation for roughly 30 minutes and then we'll jump straight into a Q&A panel where you, the viewer at home, uh, can ask questions through uh, whatever medium you're watching this through right now, whether it's Twitter or Facebook Live or YouTube Live. In the comments, the live comment section, you can ask those questions. You can ask questions about the content of the presentation or you can ask any old question about astronomy or space science or astrophysics that may have been you know, on your mind recently, maybe something you read in the news or maybe just a question that you've considered for a while. And we will have a panel consisting of four of us um, from the Astronomy and Planetary Sciences Department who all work on different areas of astrophysics to try and address the questions that you come up with. So uh, that will go and take us all the way to the end of the two hours until nine o'clock PM tonight. Our next event in this series will be, I forget the exact date, but I'll announce it in, in the next week or two. Um, and it will be given by Dr. Katerina Katsiulanus, um, who's going to be giving, yeah, I'm not sure what her talk is yet going to be on, but um, probably something related to gravity as well. Uh, we have a sister series of events called Astronomy on Tap. Uh, these traditionally are held in a bar and I'm trying to get back to going into a bar, um, but I haven't yet secured a location for that. But since the pandemic, we've been holding them on YouTube Live and Facebook Live as well. And those consist of two 15 minute presentations, a little less formal than the stargazing lecture like tonight. And then we have astronomy themed pub trivia um, following those. And our next one of those will be two weeks from this Monday. Um, one of our speakers will be Dr. Ethan Siegel, who is a theoretical astrophysicist who has a column in Forbes magazine. You may have read it. Read it. He, he has some really, really good content on there. Um, and I haven't yet secured our second speaker for that, but I anticipate having the announcement out for that next early next week. So stay tuned. Um, I think those are all the major announcements. I, I But rest assured, I am trying to get back to doing these in person. I've been um, in communication with the Caltech administration uh, now that COVID numbers are dropping sufficiently for us to be able to host events in person again. Um, and I will make every effort to record these and potentially live stream them to our, our global audience to make sure everyone continues to get the opportunity to watch these, even if they can't attend them in person. But there's something really special about getting to, to go to these in person. So, um, so it'll be good to have that again. Anyway, um, enough of my rambling. Uh, Saul, would you uh, would you would you like to join me? Hello, hey Cameron. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank today. you. Um, excellent. So, uh, are you are you here in Pasadena right now, Saul? Or yes, you... I'm in Pasadena. Right. Okay, excellent, excellent. Yes. I like the artwork behind you as well. Right? Yes, it's uh, from a local Pasadena store. Oh, really? It's, this is my study. Excellent, excellent. Here's my, my the stars are my study. Here. Yes. <laughs> um, all right. Do you want to go ahead and share your screen, and I'll I'll sure. introduce you. Sure. Is that okay? I am not seeing it yet. Uh, I'll try that again. Okay.
No worries, technical difficulties always crop up in these sorts of events. For those of you just tuning in, we're about to we're about to get the presentation started on uh, gravitational waves and and general relativity. Um, just running into some technical difficulties. I'm not sure what's happening, Cameron. Let me just get out of the Zoom and get back in. Okay, you just want to reconnect? Perfect. Uh, yeah, that's why. Okay. I'll do a little song and dance here. Um, yeah, so I'm also trying to do an astronomy on tap um, in, in a month and a half featuring Dr. Michael Wong, who uh, is a postdoc at the Carnegie Observatories, who's a huge Star Trek fan. And I'm a big Star Wars fan. So I think we're planning to do the science of Star Trek as one presentation and the science of Star Wars is another, um, but which has been coming for quite a while, but hopefully we'll, we'll, um, we'll get that going and I'll have that announced reasonably soon. Do you wanna give it another shot, Saul? Oh, perfect. Now it seems like it's working. I see your screen. Let me just make it full screen. Okay. Perfect. How's that? That's, okay, that, great. that looks great. Okay, I'll give my brief introduction for you. Um, Dr. Saul Tokolsky is a senior professor of theoretical astrophysics at both Caltech and Cornell University. Dr. Tokolsky's research focuses on general relativity, relativistic astrophysics, and computational astrophysics. And uh, he helped pioneer the field at the intersection of these topics, which is to say numerical relativity. Dr. Tokolsky has worked on naked black holes, exploding neutron stars, relativistic stellar dynamics, and planets around pulsars. His research helped predict the signal of merging black holes observed by the LIGO gravitational wave detectors that eventually earned the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics. In addition to his science, he's one of the authors of the seminal numerical recipes series of books, which are foundational works describing many different computational methods for solving a variety of different equations and problems arising in engineering and physics. And I've had a copy uh, for about 15 years. So thank you, Saul. That was a, th this is a, a great text that I've used a lot. Um, among his many awards and accolades, Dr. Tukolsky is a member of the National Academy of Science has been awarded the Dirac Medal by the International Center for Theoretical Physics and received the Einstein Prize of the American Physical Society. Um, so I'm, I'm, it's my, my huge pleasure to uh, welcome you, Saul, um, to, give, to give the presentation tonight. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Cameron, for that very generous introduction. So let's jump right in. All right, what is a black hole? So if I was giving this lecture in person and in a lecture theater, at this point, I would take my keys out of my pocket and throw them up in the air for you. And you would notice that the keys would go up and then they would pause and then fall back down. Now imagine I could throw the keys at 25,000 miles per hour. What would happen is the keys would actually keep going and they'd never fall back. That is the escape velocity from the Earth's gravity. In other words, I've given the keys enough speed that they will just escape the gravitational pull of the Earth. Now imagine I could take the Earth and somehow shrink it down in size. So everything on the Earth gets shrunk down until it's that big, right? The size of a golf ball. Now you probably know that in uh, in Newton's theory of gravity, the gravitational force depends upon how close the objects are. The closer they are together, the stronger the gravity is. So if I could make the Earth the size of a golf ball, then if I were standing on the surface, I would be closer to all the other matter in the Earth. The Earth's gravity would be even stronger. And 25,000 miles per hour would no longer be enough for me to throw my keys up and have them escape. In fact, the escape velocity would now become the speed of light. And since nothing can go faster than the speed of light, that means nothing could now escape from this shrunken earth. 
In fact, I would have turned the earth into a black hole because a black hole is a region of space and time from which nothing, not even light, can escape. Now, of course, I could never assemble enough energy to squeeze the earth down to the size you know, of just an inch or two across. But nature can make black holes out of stars. So the way that nature does it is stars are held up against their gravity by the nuclear reactions at their centers. So the inside of the star is extremely hot and that provides enough pressure to hold the star up. But if all the nuclear fuel inside the star has finished burning, there's no more source of pressure and the star will begin to collapse. And if the star starts up with enough mass, it turns out nothing can stop the collapse. It goes all the way to make a black hole. So that's how nature does it. Or at least that was a prediction of Einstein's theory of gravity. So this theory of gravity, it's got a terrible name. It's called general relativity. That, for historical reasons, that's what, what Einstein called it, and we're kind of stuck with the name. It should have been called Einstein's theory of gravity. And basically, the key idea is that gravity is no longer a force, the way that Newton thought about it, but it comes about because the presence of matter and energy distorts, warps, curves. These are all words we use to describe what the change in space and time. And it's this non-flatness of space and time that gives, that shows up as what Newton called the gravitational force. So it's quite a bizarre idea. And uh, I'm not gonna have time to go through how Einstein came up with it and, and, and so on. And, and we don't really need the details. Let's just accept that this is the current best theory of gravity we have. And one of the challenges will be, can one actually confirm these bizarre ideas? So Einstein wrote down some equations that were extremely complicated. We still don't understand everything that they predict. They're very hard to solve with traditional pencil and paper techniques. But a big breakthrough in the last few dozen years is this field of what's called numerical relativity. You can use giant computers to actually solve Einstein's equations and scope out what they predict. So let's talk about some objects where this idea of warped space and time is an important concept. So the prime one is the one I've already mentioned, namely a black hole. So the surface of a black hole, the point which if you cross, you can no longer escape, is called the horizon or the event horizon of the black hole. And the prediction is near the black hole, the space, the geometry is very curved, very warped, and time actually slows down relative to clocks that are far away where the gravity of a black hole is weak. Um, there are other objects made from strong gravity. So here's another picture to, to represent a black hole and it shows these uh, vortex-like lines which represent what happens if the black hole is spinning. So the spin of the black hole drags the space around it and can induce motions in objects that are near the black hole. Another concept from uh, general relativity is a gravitational wave. You can think of a gravitational wave in the, as similar to what happens if you drop a stone in a pond, right? Little ripples travel out. Well, you can think of the gravitational wave as ripples in the curvature of space and time that propagate outwards at the speed of light. And so one of the things I'm gonna be talking about is the connection 
between black holes and gravitational waves. Another strongly uh, gravita gravitating source is a neutron star. Uh, I'm not gonna have time to talk about that in, in the 30 minutes, but if you have questions, you can ask about neutron stars in the question period. So um, black holes have been a prediction of general relativity for a long time. And every now and again, astronomers would say, we found a black hole in such and such a galaxy. Well, that wasn't actually true. What they had found was regions of space where there was lots of mass concentrated. If general relativity was correct, then these objects had to be black holes. You couldn't have so much mass in such a small region otherwise. But we had no independent measurement which told us that near these objects, the geometry of space and time was warped as Einstein had predicted, or that the surface of the black hole, the event horizon, was like a vacuum cleaner. Right, where everything went in and nothing could come out. So in fact, there's a nice cartoon, two scientists with a telescope, it's black, it looks like a hole, I'd say it's a black hole. And that really was the situation until about five years ago. Okay, so before I say what happened five years ago, let me talk about gravitational waves. How would we detect a gravitational wave if one came by the Earth? So the easiest way to think about this is imagine you had a circular ring of particles just sitting there doing nothing. And then a gravitational wave come, came by. What would happen is that circle would get distorted. So you can see, for example, on the left, it becomes elliptical this way and then the other way and back and forth. So you see these oscillations back and forth between these elliptical shapes. And that's the effect of the gravitational wave. And on the right, you see a sort of a, a tilted version of the picture on the left. And for those of you who know about polarization states of uh, electromagnetic waves, these are representations of the two polarizations of gravitational waves. Um, that's not gonna be important if you don't uh, already know what polarization is. So another way of drawing what the wave does is these are drawings of a wave propagating down the Z direction. And we've drawn sort of lines of force. Now I've told you that in, in Gravity, in Einstein's theory, we shouldn't really think of gravity as you know, forces, but it's such a useful picture that we have even from freshman physics, that it's a nice way to draw what's happening. So you can see how that circle gets distorted into these elliptical shapes by imagining how the forces get stronger, say along this direction and then later on gets stronger along this direction. And the strength of the gravitational wave, so I have to have one equation in the talk. This is my one equation. H here represents the strength of the gravitational wave. L is the length, so you can think of that as the diameter of the circle before the wave arrives. And then Greek letter delta we use in physics to denote a change. So delta L is by how much the circle gets elongated to make an ellipse. So the, the delta L divided by the L, how the fractional change, the stronger the wave, the bigger that distortion is. And we're gonna use this to understand how a gravitational wave detector works. So here is a real life gravitational wave detector. It's part of the LIGO experiment. LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And this is in Hanford in the state of Washington. And what you can see in this picture 
uh, are two tubes in an L shape. And those are, each of them is a concrete enclosure, a semicircular enclosure, about the width of a car. And they're two and a half miles long. And inside them is a steel tube about the width of my arms apart, that, that size steel tube with a very high vacuum inside it and a laser beam that travels all the way down two and a half miles, hits a mirror at the end and comes back again. And so these two laser beams come together at this uh, building at the end station here. And if those light beams in the laser in the laser come so that their crests of the waves coincide, you get a bright spot on the, at that detector, right? The light is very bright. If the crest of one wave coincides with the trough of the other wave, then they cancel each other and you don't see any light at that corner point. And the key idea is you set things up, say that things are dark, there's nothing there. And then if a gravitational wave comes by, right, it stretches one arm and squeezes the other. And you'll see, you'll change the relative distance the light has to travel. And now the waves won't line up as you had them before. And you can detect that a wave has arrived. The effect that the scientists are looking for is extremely small. It's so small, it's one one thousandth the diameter of a proton, not an atom, right? An atom is a hundred thousand times bigger than a proton. So this is such a tiny distance that, you know, if they were to announce that they had detected a gravitational wave because, you know, they'd seen a change of this size, nobody would believe them. They'd say, oh, you guys don't know what's happening. Somebody slammed the car door in the parking lot and that shook things a little bit. And, uh, you know, don't, don't tell us you've seen a gravitational wave. So they built another one. You can tell by the different vegetation. This is this is actually two, over 2,000 miles away in Louisiana. And the idea is if you can see simultaneously the same signal at these two detectors, well separated on the Earth, then you can have confidence that what you're seeing is actually not something terrestrial, something that's coming from outer space. And so that's how we can have confidence in them seeing something. So this whole enterprise has been going on for a long time. They did a big upgrade in the sensitivity, which was completed in 2015. And within a week of turning on the detector in September 2015, they actually saw the first event. They spent a lot of time making sure that it was real. Uh, they've actually been uh, shutting down the detector, doing further upgrades and do more observing. They did their third observing run, which finished last year, about a year ago. And the fourth one will start at the end of this year. All right, now I'm gonna switch gears once again and talk about the role of computers. So we use this word computer simulation, which again is a bad word. It makes it sound like um, it's not quite real and so on. So traditionally we think about physics as having either a theory or an experiment, right? And in fact, there are two kinds of physicists usually, some who do theory and some who do experiment. But in modern physics, there's a sort of an in-between category and that's doing, using computers. So we do, so what a computer simulation means here is instead of doing a real experiment, so we can't, you know, make two black holes in the lab and smash them together and try to make gravitational waves. But instead, we can take a computer and program it with Einstein's equations to smash two black holes together and see what happens. And this has become, this has been a revolution in modern physics, this ability 
to do these kinds of experiments where you're working out what the consequence of a theory is. And then you try to compare those predictions with real observations. So here's an example, which is perhaps more mundane. Uh, in the old days, if somebody was, you know, Boeing or somebody, one, you know, that company wanted to build a new airplane, they would start by making a model, say of the wing, and they would put it in a wind tunnel and blow air very fast over the wing, and then have little instruments to measure things on the wing, you know, how much lift there was, how much friction, how much drag there would be on the, on the proposed wing design. And then they would tweak the design of the wing to build, to come up with a good design for the airplane. But instead of doing that, on a computer, you can put in a proposed shape of the wing and you could put you could put some sample points on the grid you know on a grid near the wing on the wing and near the wing and then use the equations that tell you how fluid how air flows over the wing and calculate what the lift force will be and what the drag force will be and so on um, i don't know how many people have been on a Boeing 787. Well, the reason I ask is that the Boeing 787 was the first airplane that was completely designed on a computer. There were no wind tunnel experiments. Now, I don't know whether that makes you more or less likely to want to fly on a Boeing 787, but that's the, you know, that's the reality of, of um, computers these days that uh, we hardly ever hear about wind tunnels anymore. And there are many other examples of this kind of thing in science and engineering. So here is a figure that was done way back in the 1980s when people were thinking about uh, how we would see might see gravitational waves from black holes. And you start on the left-hand side, and what the picture is supposed to represent is two black holes that are spinning, right? that's the vortex lines, and they're in orbit around each other. And then according to Einstein's theory, they should radiate gravitational waves. That's the red squiggles that are coming off. They should lose energy because the gravitational waves are carrying away the energy. So they spiral in closer and closer to each other until in the middle panel, you see them merge into a single black hole. And then the single black hole kind of oscillates a bit, still emitting some waves. And it will gradually, actually quite quickly settle down. So we call this the in-spiral phase, the merger phase in the middle, and then the ring down. The ring down is like from the idea that when you, you know, strike a bell, you hear the tone of the bell, but it gradually decays away as the bell radiates energy as sound waves. So it's the same kind of idea. And then underneath there's a, a, a sort of a picture of what Kip Thorne, who did this diagram, thought the, the H, the strength of the gravitational wave at the Earth would be. And you'll see in the in spiral, it's labeled no. And what that meant was because the gravity when the black holes are far apart is relatively weak, you can actually use Newton's theory of gravity for the orbits and quite easily calculate what the waves would be and the rate at which the black holes would in spiral. In fact, I give that now as a homework problem when I teach a course in general relativity to students. The last phase, the ring down, is, it says known. And that's because the final state is a black hole just sitting there. And so you have sort of small oscillations of that final state. And again, we know how to, physicists know how to do small oscillations of things that are close to equilibrium. And in fact, that was my PhD thesis, was to actually work out what, how to calculate this ring down phase of the orbiting black holes. 
Of course, at the time that I did that work, I had no idea that it would ever be applicable to anything in the real world. It seemed so exotic and so far-fetched that you know, it's still a big surprise to me. Now, the middle phase, there's no simple thing you can do. You have to do that on the big computer. All right, so how do you do that? Well, it's just like designing an airplane. You start with the two black holes in orbit. You set up a grid of points. You, you put down the values of the gravitational field at each point. You choose a small increment in time. And then you use Einstein's equations to tell you what the new values of the gravitational field will be at a later time. It turned out this was actually surprisingly difficult to do. And it was only in 2005 that a postdoc here at Caltech uh, was the first actually to be able to do this. We now have a, a, a quite a big collaboration called SXS, which stands for Simulating Extreme Space Times. Um, and the reason for this collaboration is it started out uh, just between uh, groups at Cornell and Caltech. But unfortunately, students have an annoying habit of graduating just when they've learned how to do something useful. Um, and so they spread out all over and some of them got jobs at other places. And so we've enlarged the collaboration. There's a whole list of places now. And these are just pictures of some of the people. Some of these are current graduate students here at Caltech. Some are former graduate students and postdocs. And so we all work together on, on doing these supercomputer simulations. Okay, I'm gonna show you a movie now to show you the results of uh, these simulations. And this is just an introductory size. What you're gonna see is two black holes, a big one and a small one. The big one is about six times the mass of the small one. The color is just to represent the idea that the black holes are spinning. So you can, you, if you imagine uh, an axis from the, you know, the center of the pink to the center of the white color, that's the direction of the rotation axis, right? The black hole is spinning. And you'll see the little one is also spinning. Okay, and so the, the, they're in orbit around each other. If we did this calculation in Newton's theory of gravity, then, you know, for example, if the central object was the sun and the small one was the earth, then we know that in Newton's theory of gravity, if you start things in a nice circular orbit, they just stay in that circular orbit, all right? But in general relativity, things are a little more complicated. Okay, so what you'll see now is that because of the spin, the fact that these black holes are spinning and dragging space and time around with each other, the orbits don't stay in a nice plane, right? The orbits tilt with respect to each other, right? It's, this is an effect that's called precession. You may have seen it with a top, right? If you have a spinning top, it typically doesn't spin nice about a fixed axis, but it actually spins and tilts and goes around like this. And that's what's, what's happening here. All right, now we're gonna slow things down a bit so that you can see the black holes merge, okay? And there the two horizons become one, and then you end up with this um, quiescent black hole at the end. Now, what I want to emphasize is this is not an artist's impression. This is the result of a real supercomputer simulation. Everything that you saw was from the supercomputer output. Okay, so in, you'll see the date. This is the front page of the New York Times, February 11th, 2016. This announced, you see, cosmic chirp from black holes colliding vindicates Einstein. And this was the public announcement of the first detection of the colliding black holes. You'll see that image they used. I'll, I'll come back to that in a little while. 
And this was a really big deal. I mean, there were newspapers all over the world, Germany, London, um, all kinds of things. And this is a, a figure from the discovery paper. On the left at the top, you'll see the, the actual H. You see it's called strain there. That's the H that, that was observed at Hanford. And then on the right in blue was the signal at Livingston. And then what they've done is they've taken the, the red signal and basically superposed it on the blue signal. And you don't have to do any fancy statistics or anything like that. Just by eye, you can see that this is the same event. Um, so just from those measurements, we know that they detected the gravitational waves. But what did the waves come from? So in the lower panel, um, if you've got good eyes, you can see that there's a gray uh, sort of thick line. That's a repeat of the information uh, in the top panel, but just broadened to account for the, the uncertainty in the, you know, the measurement of the, by the detector. And now the red curve represents one of our group's waveforms, one of our predictions from Einstein's equations. And from the fact that these now agree, and we made the prediction, assuming that this was two black holes merging, that's how we know that the source was two black holes. And you know, this was sort of one of the most exciting events for me in my professional career when I first saw this image, because, I mean, just think about it. You know, uh, over a hundred years ago, Einstein is scribbling on paper, struggles for a while, comes up with these complicated equations, predicts a crazy representation of gravity that includes black holes. A hundred years later, nature conspires to have not two puny little black holes, but two big fat ones, 30 times the mass of the sun. So strong that when they collided, the signal we had, you know, everybody was expecting weak signals. We got, there was no doubt what was seen here and arranged it that we, having built LIGO, could actually detect it. It's really, it's preposterous actually, if you think about it. Uh, this is the statue of Einstein in Washington, DC, outside the National Academy of Sciences. And I love the, the sign that somebody put on it. And this led to the Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, two of the people at Caltech and one at MIT, these were the key people in uh, designing and bringing LIGO to fruition. Of course, the real, you know, in the end, there were over a thousand people involved in the experiment. Kip Thorne, by the way, was my thesis advisor. Um, okay, so I'm going to end with another movie. And this is the one you saw earlier. This was made by three of my graduate students when they were supposed to be working on their PhD theses. And these black holes, this is all done on the computer. These are actually quite close to the masses of the first LIGO event. And then they put a star background. This is a, you know, it's a real star background, but not the one you know, where, where these uh, merging black holes were. But just to illustrate how the gravity of the black holes distorts the image. You saw all these stars that apparently moved around. That's because the light, some light rays from the background on their way to us, to our eyes or our camera, they, they get distorted by the gravity. Some of them actually go loop around the black holes before they get to us. So we see the image in a different direction. And that was the, the you know, that ring that you kind of see and all these funny things. And again, I want to emphasize, this is not a, uh, an artist's rendition. This is a result, both the black hole trajectories and the effect on the star background were all calculated according to Einstein's, Einstein's theory. And it's interesting, uh, what I like to do is imagine where will we be a hundred years from now? Maybe a hundred years from now, 
we'll have some kind of a telescope or something, I can't imagine how, where we might actually get close enough that we would have a real image of this, not a computer simulation. I don't know, but it's nice to speculate. So thank you, I'm gonna stop there and we'll turn it over to the panel for questions. Excellent presentation, Saul. That was really that was really comprehensive. Thank you. Um, we already have a lot of questions building up. Um, just very quickly, just for co uh, confirmation, the movie that you just showed um, yes. were the timescales of the merging black holes and the and the lensing effects. Were they representative or were they slowed down? No, no, no. The actual merger that that last few orbits actually is a fraction of a second. Wow. It was like that. Yes, it's very quick. Oh, amazing. Okay. Yeah, that, by the way, that movie has been downloaded from YouTube and New York Times websites so close to a million times. It's wow. uh, it's a big hit. Yeah, well, it's good. It's good at illustrating a, a complicated topic that, you know, boils it down into something visually, you know, comprehensible. So, um, OK, so uh, audience members, this is not over yet. You've just had the first act. And now it is time for our panel Q&A where we will uh, seek to answer your questions on the content of the presentation that you just saw, as well as any other questions that you might have about astronomy, astrophysics, space science, physics, whatever, whatever you can throw at us, we'll do our best to, to respond to. So if you're watching it in Facebook or YouTube or Twitter, um, feel free to use the, the chat section of that particular medium to write your questions and, and we'll, uh, I'm, we're going to be joined. It'll be uh, Dr. Tokolsky, myself, Dr. Hummels, and then can I have our other two members of the, Q, of the, of the panel, the expert panel chime in here? Sophia and Julie, welcome guys. Hi. Um, so as we get started, what I'd just like each of you to do, oh, it sounds like there's a bit of an echo in, in one of your, maybe, maybe uh, uh, turn down, turn down your, your sound a little bit. Maybe that'll help. And I'll try not to shout. <laughs> um, can I get, uh, Julie, why don't you go first? Would you just give like a one minute kind of um, description of who you are and what sort of science you work on so our audience knows what you're a specialist in? Yeah, of course. Um, so I'm Julie, and I am a second year graduate student at Caltech in the Planetary Sciences Department. Uh, and my research is mainly focused on characterizing the compositions of planets and how they form. So I look at the atmospheres of planets to figure out what's in them, and maybe how exactly they came to exist in the first place. And I also do a side project on how moons form. So like, for example, the moons around Jupiter, which are a really cool system of moons that are very interesting to learn about. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And Sophia Gallego, would you like to, to yeah, I pronounced it right. Hello, everybody over there. Yes. <laughs> so I'm a postdoc at Caltech. I've been here just a couple of months. And uh, my research is uh, in extragalactic astrophysics. And uh, more in particular, I studied the large scale structure of the universe. So uh, what is around and between galaxies? What is more beyond that? And how this a large scale structure, which we call the cosmic web because it looks like a spider web in three dimensions, interacts with the galaxies and how they co evolve together in the universe and, and make um, how these interactions make galaxies uh, form and evolve. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Um, so, oh, and I, I guess just for full, full coverage, I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I do research on computational modeling of galaxies and large chunks of the universe, um, kind of a combination of what Sophia works on, but then using some of the techniques that, that Saul was describing in terms of using uh, computational modeling of, of how these systems form and evolve and, and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, so hopefully amongst the four of us, we can cover a pretty broad section of, of the question space. Uh, so I encourage you guys to ask questions in, in either Facebook or, or YouTube or, or Twitter. Um, we already have a number of questions that kind of piled up early on uh, in, during the, the presentation. So I'll try to work my way through some of those. Um, so most of them are related. Most of them are going to be focused at you, Saul, because they, they're related to the content of your, of your presentation. So um, 
One question from Chris Georgie is, is there a theoretical minimum energy for a black hole? So, so that's actually a very good question. Um, and uh, what, the th what the theory actually turns out to predict is that you can actually make, so if you imagine, for example, trying to focus some energy down and then get enough energy to make a black hole, you can actually make a black hole that's as small as you like. Now, of course, this is, you know, this is a theoretical prediction. Um, we don't believe that in nature, we're gonna find microscopic black holes. The, the only way we could imagine that happening would be back in the early, you know, during the Big Bang. Maybe there were some small black holes that were formed then. So we really think that black holes formed from stars would have masses that are comparable to the mass of the star that, that they formed from. I see, okay. Yeah, because I've always heard about like primordial black holes potentially being these very small structures, but right. it seems like the formation mechanism would be, yeah, it'd have to happen kind of before the physics that we know today exists because it seems really hard to produce those in present. Present time. Right. We, we don't really know. We just have to keep an open mind. I think that, uh, you know, again, it's going to be the observers who tell us poor theorists um, which of our models is the right one. <laughs> As always. There is also a theory that these tiny black holes can be the, the ones which are actually made dark matter. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I we mean, don't I have a lot of constraints on dark matter, unfortunately. Um, or, well, we have some, but not enough to really to, to have it all figured out yet. Um, okay, um, a related question to this. Uh, Ananda Ganguly asks, so black holes have angular momentum. You were describing the spins of the black holes. And in that movie, it showed the color being proportional to the spin. So black holes have angular momentum, but if that's true, doesn't that mean that there can't be a singularity in the center of the, of the black hole where all of that mass is? Because in order to have angular momentum, there has to be some moment of inertia. I mean, I'm kind of adding in what Ananda was asking, but doesn't there have to be a moment of inertia to allow that to, have, to carry angular momentum? And if it's an infinitesimal point, it can't have that? Right, so, so what happens inside a black hole is actually a bit of a mystery because if you take Einstein's theory and then you just ask, you know, well, what does it predict inside the black hole? Well, it predicts a singularity. Now, a singularity in physics is just a fancy way of saying, I give up, right? The theory has <laughs> broken down. So what it really means is we don't actually understand the, the gravity has gotten so strong that what we really need to do is use quantum mechanics to tell us what is happening there. And unfortunately, we don't actually have a theory yet of quantum gravity. So all we can say for the time being is that um, the black hole can have its angular momentum. It's somehow distributed in the inside in some way that we don't quite precisely understand. There is a breakdown of, these, of Einstein's theory as you get near the center of the black hole. And you know, maybe some young person in the audience will one day uh, come up with the correct quantum theory of gravity and then we'll know the answer. Exciting. So keep studying, uh, everyone. Keep studying. Um, there is a question, it looks like, from one of your, your children because the, the comment says, <laughs> Hi, Dad. <laughs> so I will ask them, Hi, Dad. Great presentation. The kids want to know what would happen if a person fell into a black hole. Would time speed up or slow down for that person? And how quickly would they get ripped apart? Right, you can see the nine and 12 year old mentality, right? <laughs> how quickly will they get ripped apart? But anyway, um, so that's actually a very, a very good question. So it depends on the size of the black hole. So, 
we know of two kinds of black holes at least that exist in the universe. So the one is the kind that LIGO has been seeing where they're about the mass of a sun. So first of all, if you fell into that, at first you wouldn't notice anything particularly bad as you got close to the black hole. Um, by the time you realized that you had passed the surface of the black hole, it would be too late. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to suddenly turn on your rocket and get out again, right? So you would fall in and you, what, what would happen is you would feel that stretching and squeezing. It would be, you, you would be like a tube of toothpaste, right? Where the gravity between your feet and your head would be so different that you would be stretched apart that way and at the same time, your waist, if you were ever trying to, you know, have a slimmer waist, now that would be a good way to do it. <laughs> squeeze this way, right? And then as you got closer and closer to the center of the black hole, you would be completely ripped apart into your atoms. And then your atoms would be ripped apart into protons and neutrons and whatever. And then finally, quantum gravity. We don't know what your ultimate fate would be. And for the a black hole with the mass of the sun, this is pretty quick. This is a few milliseconds, fraction, in fact, fractions of a millisecond uh, that this would happen in. But there are also big black holes at the centers of galaxies. And some of these can be a billion times the mass of the sun. And that means everything is a billion times slower. So here, when you fell into the black hole, the gravity would actually be quite weak. You wouldn't notice that it's too late. And you would fall towards the center, but gradually you would feel the stretching and squeezing. And this would take you years before you get the tube of toothpaste effect and get ripped apart. Wonderful. We have some time before we get ripped apart. So that's, that's good. Time to ponder our fates. Um, all right. Uh, lots of great questions from our audience here. Um, Stephen Schreier asks, during the, the known ring down phase, I, uh, side note, I didn't realize that that was your thesis was to calculate the ring down. That's pretty exciting. Were you, so you were able to do that without um, computational modeling that was done analytically? Yeah, that was done with pencil and paper, yeah. I see, okay, wonderful. Okay, so the question is, uh, during that ring down phase of the black hole merger, is the event horizon's diameter, does it change by a substantial amount? Like like a, a, a reasonable fraction of the size of the, the black hole? Um, it, it, it's a, well, what happens is the, um, you could kind of see in the movie, right, that when the, when the black holes first coalesce, that sort of that peanut like shape thing, yeah, yeah is it, very distorted, very non-spherical or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So you're starting out with that shape, but it very quickly settles down to something that's close to spherical, you know, has a little flattening because of the spin. Um, so it's actually quite quick. Um, okay, just as a, just so we're mixing it up and getting questions for all of our all of our panel panel members. Um, there have been a couple of questions asked um, for the other panelists as well. So, so I encourage people to continue to ask questions both for Saul but also the other panelists as well, so we can mix it up on all sorts of different. Um, uh, facets of science. So Nikki Perifergan asks for Julie, do you believe in the proposed discoveries of exomoons and how, they're, how will their discovery help us? So exomoons being moons around planets that are around other stars from our own sun, correct? Yes, that is exactly what an exomoon is. And I've got to say the current detections, I'm a bit skeptical of, um, though I really wish they're true. Um, so when it comes to detecting planets around other stars, what we do to look for them is we look for, the main method is called the transit method. And this is done by studying the star's brightness over time and looking for periodic 
dimming of that brightness of that star, which corresponds to a planet passing in front of the star um, as seen by Earth. So it looks like the star is just dimming um, repeatedly over the same as the planet orbits around it. And now if you have a moon that's also orbiting around that planet, then you get a fun even funkier shape than just a straight consistent dimming. You can have a little blip on the side of it, which corresponds to not only the planet passing in front of the sun, but also that little tiny moon that's attached to it. Um, and because the signal of this dimming is proportional to the size of the object that's blocking out the light, uh, for planets, it's, it can already be quite small, but for moons that are attached to them, it can be even smaller, which means that given the current precision of our instruments, this is extremely hard to measure. Um, so that's why I'm a little skeptical of current observations of these um, of, of exomoons, the current claimed ones, because it can be hard enough to confirm a planet um, as it is. So it would be very exciting if they were actual moons that we could detect and observe, because it would broaden our, a lot of our um, knowledge about our galaxy, um, and it would be very exciting to test some theories of formation of these moons, but as of yet, we don't really have any confirmed exomoons to study. Exciting, exciting, yeah. Um, I've even heard of exocomets that have been proposed out there, so yeah, like asteroid belts or whatnot around these systems as well, which is pretty exciting. There's some fun claim detections of also um, ring systems around these planets, more similar to like similar to the rings that we've seen around Saturn. Um, again, that's very tenuous evidence for these, but it would be super exciting if we could find a planet that had elaborate extensive rings like Saturn, because they're beautiful. So. Yeah, would the, would the rings, I guess you could potentially get that from the transiting method where maybe the rings would block more of the light than the, the planet would if it weren't off, if it were out of the, out yeah, of so the plane. It has to be in alignment. So you'd have to have kind of like the rings kind of tilted just right so that it would make the planet appear bigger. Um, and that's actually some of the, one of the main lines of evidence people have proposed for these rings is in the discovery of these so-called super puff planets, which are planets that have extremely high radii, like they're extremely large, but their mass isn't much bigger than Earth. So there's no real reason that we can think of why these planets would appear so big if they're not super massive. Um, so that's one of the explanations people have proposed for these is maybe they just have really big rings around them. Interesting. Oh, that's cool. That's really cool. Uh, okay, let's see. And there, um, there was another question also from Nikki for Sophia. Will the James Webb Space Telescope observations or will James, James Webb in general help um, help with your research, with the study of, of like protoclusters or your study of, of the cosmic web and, and that sort of thing? Yeah, actually, um, I'm part of a group that gained a little bit of time to observe with the James Webb Telescope. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and so um, what I was focusing during my PhD that I did in Switzerland uh, was studying um, the uh, gas around and between galaxies. And we find this through emission. And uh, how do we do that? We just uh, have in very um, bright sources of light, of radiation, which are quasars that you may know are like produced by like these supermassive black holes in the interior of the galaxies that heat up the gas around them. And this radiation goes through the space and around the space uh, of the, these quasars and makes them shine. Mm -hmm. But the predicted uh, amount of brightness we obtain from that is very dim. So we have to design very specific techniques to find um, this light uh, around uh, these quasars, which we call uh, the halos around, or bubbles, uh, um, Lyman alpha bubbles, because of the light in which we find them. Um, so we started to detect these, yeah? But James Webb will allow us, because it's uh, in, in in a more into a red light compared to, for example, the Hubble telescope, to find this uh, structure, these halos around these bright quasars and other sources much uh, earlier in the epoch of the universe. And not only that, but also find uh, the emission of this gas around the, these sources in other lines. Mm -hmm. uh, and the capacities of James Webb for finding these are spectacular. So we, we have uh, some time to study some of the quasars we already find um, this light around uh, uh, in a more mar um, in a much mar uh, more deep uh, observation. So uh, we're very excited <laughs> because uh, the, um, this is one of the fields which actually is kind of the future of, uh, 
of the interaction between the galaxies and their environment. That's something that is actually very least known uh, in the field of galaxy evolution. How they, we know a lot about the internal processes of the galaxies, but not so much of how these processes interact with whatever is around them. And we starting to realize that galaxies are not just island universes, but they are actually evolved in this whole big structure. And the James Webb and our research are like, trying to focus on understanding that process. And also Cameron is, is working on that in those endeavors, <laughs> yeah. That's true, that is true. Mm -hmm. Um, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to some of the results of, 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 of James Webb once it starts taking observations, which should be, I think, any day now, really, um, now that they've got the mirrors aligned and calibrated and focused and such. So I, I believe the first images are set to, to be announced to the public um, in early June, I believe, is when they're going to start putting these out. There will be a big... Pro you it will be hard to miss. It will be in the news. And, and for those people paying attention to uh, science news, it'll be all over. So um, I encourage people to, to keep their ears, ears open uh, for any news on that front, but it should be pretty sweet. Um, here's a question that's kind of, uh, kind of up my alley and kind of up Saul's here. And it's from um, viewer Heather Grutens asking, when you're calculating the expansion of the universe, do you account for the gravitational pull supermassive black holes can have against that expansion? Everyone's probably familiar with the idea of the Big Bang and the expanding universe. Well, as, as Saul was talking about, these massive objects like supermassive black holes or black holes in general have gravitational pull that's, that's kind of pulling against that sort of expansion. And so the question is, is it, do we have to account for that? Is it enough that it kind of slows down the expansion um, either globally or locally? And um, similarly, a similar question from, from Heather as well is, do supermassive black holes play a part in anchoring, anchoring so to speak, the galaxy itself? Um, because something that, that many of you may know is, uh, at least in all of our observations, pretty much every galaxy that we predict to exist or that have been observed have some sort of massive black hole in their center. Um, and I guess anchoring is, is some, some way of, of referring to that. But at least in the stuff that I do, so like I said, I run computer simulations of galaxies and larger scale structures and the expansion of the universe. We do um, oftentimes account for the presence of supermassive black holes in specialized versions of those simulations. But oftentimes the mass of those black holes, even though they are quote unquote supermassive black holes, is far less than the overall mass of the galaxy itself. So for instance, in our own Milky Way, our Milky Way um, has a supermassive black hole in its center that's referred to by the kind of obscure, strange, esoteric name, Sagittarius A star, um, which I'm not gonna go into why it's called that, but that's what we refer to it. And it was actually um, researchers, not this year, but was it last year, were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for their research on that. Um, Andrea Ghez, who's a professor at UCLA, and um, what's the gentleman's name? Reinhard Genzel in Germany and, and I guess also affiliated with Berkeley. Um, yes, so they've done a huge amount of research on that black hole in the center of our galaxy and, and, and were awarded as such uh, with the Nobel Prize. But the, to, I'm, I'm rambling now. The, the point is um, the, the mass of that supermassive black hole in the center of the Milky Way is a few million times the mass of our sun, which is very massive. Um, but if you compare that with the total mass of our entire galaxy, it's, it's about a million times more massive than that black hole. You'd have to have about a million times those, uh, that supermassive black hole to make up the total mass in our galaxy. It's just a lot of stars and dark matter and gas uh, that, that, that compose all of the galaxy. And so for the most part in the simulations, we don't have to worry in detail at the presence, I mean, I guess it depends on what you're trying to model, but if you're trying to just model the overall expansion of the universe, you don't have to necessarily account for each individual supermassive black hole in the galaxies. You mostly account for the galaxies themselves that, that outweigh those individual black holes by a substantial amount. Um, I don't know, do you guys want to add on that at all? Saul, do you want to add on that at all? No, I think that's okay. a good answer. Okay. Um, let's see. So lots, lots of questions. 
There's another one from a family member of yours uh, here, Saul. So Phil Adams asks, he says, great stuff, father-in-law. Can you, the question, he has the question, can you fall out of a black hole? You can fall into a black hole. Can you fall out of a black hole? Uh, no, that's the, that's why it's a black hole, not a white <laughs> hole, right? That whatever goes in is trapped and ends up being ripped apart in the center and nothing can actually come out, at least according to Einstein. At least according to Einstein. Yeah, so I mean, you bring up, you bring up a white hole and I've always heard references to it in kind of popular science and whatnot, but is there any, is there any theoretical groundwork for, um, for a white hole? I, I, I also, you know, people, a lot of times in science fiction, we invoke wormholes. And I know that right. there's like the Einstein-Rosen bridge that can roughly describe that kind of uh, structure in the universe where you have stuff go into a black hole and go through space time and then get spit out a white hole. But does anyone uh, in the numerical relativity community actually believe that this is a possibility or is this kind of a stretch within the current model? It, so so it's a stretch, and, and but but it's, it's so embedded in, in a lot of movies and science fiction. So maybe let me just take a minute to Absolutely. explain where, where, where this idea sort of originated and why we should be skeptical. So um, oftentimes in physics, we have some mathematical theory of some phenomenon. And if we just pretend we're mathematicians and just work out the consequences of the theory, we, get, we can get some bizarre predictions, but we always have to remember that our theories are typically very idealized. We make some simplifying assumptions in order to be able to describe, I mean, nature is pretty complicated. Um, and so we always have to do a reality check. If we get one of these bizarre predictions, is it consistent with the assumptions that we made in getting the theory in the first place? So uh, white holes are a mathematical solution of Einstein's equations, right? So that if I just, you know, was a mathematician and you gave me these equations and I was clever enough, I could get the solution that said, here's a white hole prediction. Okay, but the, the problem is you have to then ask, well, just as we can have a black hole solution, we can then ask, how do you make the black hole? And then we can sort of go back a step and say, oh, we can have a collapsing star and that could turn into the black hole solution. So now you have to ask, well, I have this white hole object. How do I get it? How does nature produce an object like that? And we, there's no mechanism, and we you can actually sort of show that there's no mechanism of, you know, doing anything with masses or collapsing objects that actually can make the white hole. So the, the only way you could do it is you'd have to say that somehow, you know, when the universe was created, some, you know, whatever, it, was, it had this white hole with stuff spewing out. And another reason why we don't like white holes is uh, it, it destroys predictability. Anything can come out of the white hole. And we can't say, you know, we like, as physicists, we like to be able to make predictions. I mean, that's the whole point of doing physics, to understand what conditions are now and be able to say what, what's going to happen in the future. And wormholes are a similar kind of thing. They are mathematical solutions that, you know, a mathematician can find in Einstein's equations. But in order to produce them, you'd have to have a very peculiar kind of matter, which if it existed, it would violate a lot of things that we already know about fundamental physics. So much as I would love to you know, have, it would make space travel a lot easier and all these kinds of things. Um, unfortunately, I think they're, they're relegated to science fiction. That's a shame. <laughs> I agree with you. What a shame. That's a shame. Um, 
There is a kind of a technical question from Dr. Phil Yoon, who asks about the numerical relativity code that was developed by your collaboration, the, um, the SXS, what was it, the... Um, simulating extreme space. Simulating extreme, yes, exactly. So uh, the question is, does that code simulate black hole, black hole interactions, black hole neutron star interactions, neutron star interactions, or all of the above? All of the above. I see. Okay. Okay. Do they end up being very similar interactions? It's just less massive or or in the in the in the case where it's a neutron star. And just so everyone is is familiar, neutron stars, as 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 uh, Professor Tukolsky alluded to earlier, are um, are an, uh, another kind of extreme gravitational environment, but they have uh, a matter surface. It's not quite as as extreme as the black hole, and so there is like a, a surface to it and and, and mass that can that can escape. So it, or is it just like turning down the gravitational strength for those? No, energies? actually, you get you get a whole bunch of interesting phenomena now, because this is sort of you can imagine this is like the nucleus of an atom, mm -hmm. you know, which has neutrons and protons in, but on a scale of a star. So you imagine a whole single nuclear object that's the size of a star, um, but that's extremely compact, extremely dense with strong gravity. Now imagine smashing two of them together at say half the speed of light and you get fireworks, literally <laughs> fireworks. And LIGO has detected one of these events um, with all the associated fireworks that were seen by gamma ray astronomers, X-ray astronomers, ultraviolet, all the wavelengths, a spectacular display. And in fact, that discovery paper had not only the 1200 authors of the LIGO collaboration as co-authors, but it had 2,500 astronomers from all around the world on 70 different telescopes who <laughs> observed this phenomenon. It was really a, uh, this was in 2017, and really a spectacular. Yeah, I heard that it, at, at the time of that uh, observation, it was roughly like one third of all the PhD astronomers in the world were somehow collaborating on this particular yes. project. I was not among them. I didn't get invited, uh, sadly, but- uh, I think it was a third of the observers. Oh, maybe the observers. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> It's pretty amazing that everyone could could work together on this like target of opportunity. Um, all right, a question for Julie: Can solar system moons, going back to the uh, to the topic of moons, can solar system moons give us clues to the internal structure of planets? Perhaps the planet the planets that the moons are orbiting around. Mm. That's an interesting question. Uh, and there's a lot of ways um, in which moons can actually give us information about the interiors of their planets. Um, one of the ways is just through their gravitational interactions with their planets. So you can think of um, as a moon is orbiting around the planet, the actual distribution of mass within the planet can have an effect on the moon's orbit. So if you study a moon's orbit long enough and watch as it evolves through time, then you actually might be able to determine something about the interior structure of that planet and how the, the mass is distributed. Um, and if you are able to learn something about the density um, distribution within in, in the interior of a planet, you can be able to determine, does it have an iron core? How big is the iron core? Um, might it be a more massive material like silicate in there or something like more akin to water, which is a little bit less dense? Um, and as for other information that you can get about the interiors of planets from their moons, uh, you can also take a step back and even look at how that moon formed. Did it form similar to how Earth's moon may be formed, where it actually formed, may have formed via collision um, early on in the Earth's history, where then the moon was could, is thought to have formed out of material that was basically knocked off of the Earth? Or does it form more like how we think Saturn, uh, sorry, Jupiter's moons formed where it, they assembled from dust grains that were orbiting around Jupiter in the early days of Jupiter's formation, um, akin to how we think planets form. So if depending on the, which process it formed, you may be able to get additional information. So there's a ton of information that we can glean about a variety of different things 
not just the moon, but the the planet it might be orbiting as well, just from just from like the orbit of the the moon, really. That's amazing. Um, and I guess, yeah, I guess you had mentioned that in looking at exomoons, it wasn't yet necessarily super, super confirmed. But presumably, if we were to look at the orbit, you know, be able to track the orbits of individual exomoons around their exoplanets, then maybe you could glean this information about those systems as well, even though we can't like, you know, yeah, go there or whatever. Yes, it would require a lot more precision and from telescopes than we currently have and a lot of years of obs observing, but potentially, yes. Potentially, cool, that's super cool. Um, okay, let's see. Maybe I, ha I have a related question to Yuli. Yeah. Because uh, I, I heard that the most known theory about the formation of our own moon was this catastrophic collision, right? Um, but I also read long ago that it wasn't like another theory, like a slow formation rather than a collision, a catastrophic collision. I don't know how the status quo of these uh, studies are. Yeah. Um, sorry, I didn't catch the last bit, sorry, of your question. Uh, so, like, sorry, like the state of the art. I mean, what is the most, um, most recent theory that is like rather this cata cataclysmic event or was more like ah. a slow creation of the moon? Yes, um, I'm not super familiar with the Earth moon system. My research is mostly focused on the uh, Galilean moons of Jupiter. Um, but the, the theory that I did learn when I was coming up through undergrad was about the catastrophic collision. That seems to be the one that people are mostly focused on in modeling. Um, I see lots of images of like the torus of material that eventually co coalesces into what we know as the moon, which is very fun simulation. So I recommend checking those out if people have the opportunity to. <laughs> Yeah, I remember there were other less favored models like the capture model where the moon was captured as it, you know, gravitationally captured. It, it wasn't originally orbiting around the Earth, but it doesn't match the constraints that they have very similar isotope ratios in terms of a lot of their molecules and stuff. I think there were a few other ones, but yeah, I, it seems like, right, the, the collision model is the most highly favored of the... Yeah, it seems to, that's as much as far as I can recall. And also, like you can tell based on the orientation of the moon's orbit um, relative to the Earth's rotation, that it, they're, since they're so close to being in the same plane, that it's probably more likely that it was material from the Earth as opposed to capture, which can be more eccentric or inclined. So, um, I I actually have a question for you, Saul. Um, and so I've heard an apocryphal story about that. And, and again, this is apocryphal, so I don't know if this is right, but you're the person who might be able to answer this for me. And that is that the numerical relativity codes that were existing uh, prior to 2005, when eventually there was success made, uh, there was something where the models would never converge. They would never uh, work correctly for having two merging black holes. And it would just kind of freeze or break or crash in the midst of that process. And I had heard that there was a postdoc or a graduate student who inadvertently uh, set a parameter to be something incorrect. They were typing in their stuff and they made a mistake. And then it finally worked. And, and it, so it was kind of a serendipitous accident that allowed, allowed this thing to, to make progress. Is that totally BS or does that actually have any root in truth? It's, it's partially true, right? Okay. So the, 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 the history is, I, I mentioned earlier that there was a postdoc at, uh, at Caltech who did the first successful simulation, uh, Franz Pretorius. And that was the culmination uh, so even though, I mean, it's sort of an important thing. We like to think of, uh, you know, the people who make great discoveries as being these sort of isolated geniuses, <laughs> you know, while, while the rest of us sort of toil away every now and again, you know, there's an Einstein who, you know, tells us the way forward and so on. Well, that's not true, even for Einstein, right? We, we all rely on the work the, the, that's been, that other people have been doing. And the, the important discoveries come when somebody is able to synthesize um, ideas that have been floating around typically. And so in the case of, the, of these numerical simulations, uh, people have been trying for, you know, from the early 1990s, that's when supercomputers got 
powerful enough to actually try to attempt to do these, you know, orbiting uh, black hole simulations. They've been trying unsuccessfully. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, the codes just would give up, get, you know, infinities and all kinds of nonsense uh, during the simulations. And um, through the work of a lot of people, that we, meaning the community, began to understand, you know, why, first of all, why was this happening? Um, you know, what were the mathematical reasons? How might we fix them and so on? And then uh, what happened in the case of Franz Pretorius, he had a code which blew up like everybody else's, but another young postdoc named Karsten Gundlach, who was sort of more mathematical, came to visit Caltech and described something that he'd been working on and said to Franz, why don't you try this? And that turned out to be the secret source that made things work. Um, now the, the apocryphal story refers to another group. You know, once, once you have a problem that everybody has been struggling with and then somebody shows that it can be solved, everybody returns to the problem with sort of renewed enthusiasm. And so another group which had been trying a different technique um, had a technique which was supposed to only work for setting up the initial conditions for two black holes in orbit. And it's true that um, one of the young researchers in the group set up the initial conditions, you know, went off, I don't know where to lunch or went home for the night or whatever it was, and didn't, you know, didn't have it stop. <laughs> Let it keep going. Let it just keep going. And, and it kept going and it made an orbit. Ah. So it was a different technique, not the original technique that France. This was about six months later. I and see. so so there are actually two different techniques that both work. Ah. And today is one or the other of those used in the in the kind of modern infrastructure they're both, they're both used they're both, they're both used both. i see oh that's pretty cool that's great i like stories like that <laughs> um all right there was a really insightful question here that kind of tied together two aspects of um something julie was just discussing as well as what Saul had been describing earlier and that was by Stuart Gowdy asking with time dilation, you know, this slowing, you know, this slowing of time in the presence of a high, uh, a nearby massive object, it would take mass some time to get to the, the center of, uh, of a black hole. Can close orbiting stars around a black hole detect mass clumps moving within the event horizon of a black hole in the same way that Julie was talking about. We can use moons to probe the internal structure of planets. Can we use like a, the orbit of a nearby star to probe the distribution of matter within the event horizon of a black hole? Well, Julie, you want me to have a go for that? <laughs> you can have a go, I have no idea. <laughs> okay. So, so that's actually a pretty good question. So the first thing is, um, the slowing of time is when you make a comparison between distant clocks and clocks close to the black hole. If you were, you know, falling into the black hole from somewhere nearby, you wouldn't notice anything unusual in, in your local timekeeping. I mean, your heart would still go at the same rate. Maybe it would speed up when you realized, you know, that you were going that to come to the toothpaste. <laughs> but, 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 right, it's, it's physical processes, time, uh, you know, in a local sense, that there's nothing funny that's happening, right? It's this comparison between distant clocks and, and nearby clocks. But the other interesting part is, what, is there some way for an external observer to detect what fell into the black hole, right? Was it orbiting objects or something like that? And the answer, according to, again to Einstein's theory, is no. That black holes are actually quite simple objects. 
in the sense that from the outside, if you have a black hole, all that you can measure is you can measure its mass by how much gravity it exerts. You can measure its spin by how much it drags the space around it. And if a black hole happens to have a charge, which we don't expect for black holes produced in nature, but in principle could have a charge, you could detect it by measuring the electric force. But all the other information, right? Did you make the black hole out of a collapsing star? Or did you make it out of throwing a whole bunch of TV sets together? You can't tell. All you can tell is what's the mass of the TV sets that you threw in. That ties into a question, I guess, that you basically just answered by Luna Watanabe. Are there different types of black holes other than spinning and non-spinning? So you've got spinning, non-spinning, you've got charge or non-charge, and then you've got That's the mass. It. Those are the only properties of black holes. That's right. Okay. Maybe you can talk about the mass, right? The supermassive yeah. black holes, yes. the small yes. black holes, and the intermediate black holes that haven't been discovered yet. Yeah, it's That's the right. mass, the spin, and the charge. That's it, three numbers. And usually charge is not important, as I said said in astronomy, so it's really just two numbers that describe. Have any of the um, the mergers that have been detected with LIGO been consistent with a black hole that doesn't have a spin, or do they all have some measurable spin? So, so the, a lot of the measured uh, spins are, are very small. So within the errors, it's quite hard for the, at the current sensitivity to get a precise measurement of the spin because it's got a relatively small effect on that on that strain that's produced. But but so for many of them, the spin is, as we say, consistent with zero. Right. So there's there's some probability distribution for the spin, you know, that has a small width that includes zero. But there are other black holes that have been where the spin has been detected, where the probability distribution is well away from zero. So within the accuracy of the measurement, we can say it's spinning um, and it could be spinning quite rapidly and it's certainly not zero spin. There's a question here. Sorry, there's a lot of gravitational questions. So I know a lot of these questions are going to, uh, to Saul, but um, I, hope, I hope that's okay with you, uh, with Julie and Sophia. Um, but I encourage people to continue to ask questions appropriate for, for Sophia and, and, uh, and Julie as well on exoplanets, exomoons, and cosmic web, and proto-clusters, and all sorts of things. So Gene Stratton asks, at what speed, you mentioned this in your talk, at what speed do gravitational waves travel, and why, why are they traveling at that characteristic speed? Right. So again, according to Einstein's theory, they travel at the sp same speed as light. And, um, and, and basically, that's sort of built into the theory. But that doesn't mean that real gravitational waves do travel at the speed of light. But in fact, um, this, merge, this event where the two neutron stars merged and were seen both gravitationally and electromagnetically allowed us to give actually a very precise test of this idea. Because from the time that the gravitational wave signal was detected by LIGO, compared, so the first electromagnetic signal was actually this gamma ray burst, which arrived about two seconds after the, uh, the gravitational wave signal. Now this was over a distance of almost, in, well, I have to convert for you, roughly a gigaparsec, so roughly, uh, roughly a billion light years away, right? So the light took roughly a billion years to reach us, and the gravitational wave took roughly a billion years. And they arrived within two seconds of each other. So if the speed was very different, why would they arrive within two seconds of each other, right? So we were able to, to, to know just from that single measurement alone that 
if it's not the speed of light, it's within many, many, you know, 0.99999s, nine, many, many nines, that it might as well be the speed of light. Pretty exciting to be able to, do, to, uh, to measure that for the first time. Actually, it's not the first time. So, I mean, this is something maybe up, up Julie's right. alley. I mean, I mean, I mean, the one of the earliest measurements of the speed of light and the speed of gravity um, comes from uh, observing the moons of Jupiter and later on binary star systems. Because from Newton's theory of gravity, one can calculate the orbits of the planets. Right, or, the, or the moons of Jupiter. And then we observe the eclipses when these moons pass behind Jupiter. And so if the speed of light and the, the gravity effects were very different from what they actually are, the theory wouldn't be able to predict the eclipses very accurately. We would have the wrong predictions. <laughs> And so that's not quite as good as because the, the distance to Jupiter isn't as far as the, you know, a billion light years. But uh, that was one of the earliest ways in which we knew that uh, these speeds were, were relatively close. That's interesting. I did not know that. <laughs> Two uh, sort of related questions, mostly about the, the strength of the distortions from the from the gravitational waves themselves, the distortions of space time. So Zap Zap Van Zap Van asks: One, can gravitational waves be themselves gravitationally lensed in the same way that we have electromagnetic waves that get lensed by some sort of foreground object that has mass? And related to that, Nikki Perifergan asks: When supermassive black holes merge. Um, and our nearby close stars, can they, is there a disturbance of the space-time sufficient to be able to rip apart the, those nearby stars? Because we, one of the things that, that many, maybe some of our viewers are familiar with are things called tidal disruption events. And that's when a star gets too close to a black hole, like a supermassive black hole. And it's the extreme environment in which it sits, it pulls, it, it yanks apart. It's it's kind of like that sp spaghettification um, effect where it yanks apart the star. So could just the transmission of sufficiently strong gravitational waves through a star be sufficient to yank it apart? All right. So so the the, the first part of the question um, was uh, remind me it was about the, uh, the the first part of the question was can the gravitational waves themselves be the yes. 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 Um, so yes, uh, the, the, the waves, you know, in, any kind of wave that's carrying energy should be subject to gravity. And so in particular, so just to remind people about what gravitational lensing is, um, it, was, it was a prediction of Einstein's in fact, uh, and later on, uh, from a prediction turned into a, a, big, a tool in astronomy to, for example, if you have a distant quasar uh, and a foreground galaxy, then the light from the distant quasar, if the things line up just precisely enough, the light can reach us by two different paths because the light ray gets deflected, right? So just by the gravity of that intervening galaxy. And so when we see that, we'll see one light ray. It looks like the image is up there somewhere. And then we'll also see another light ray, which comes to us, say, from down below. And so we'll see two images of the quasar. And in fact, you can see multiple. I don't know what the record is. Maybe Sophia can, can, can tell me. I know we've seen it, at least four images uh, the last time that I, that I knew. Um, so, so you can have the same effect with gravitational waves. And in fact, there's a big debate going on now uh, about the LIGO events. Uh, LIGO has now seen roughly 100 events. And um, the prediction is that out of about 100 events, 
we should expect at least of order one to be a lensed event. And how would we know? Well, we would know by the properties, right? We would, we would estimate that, look at this event. Um, it has this mass, this spin, and the companion has this mass, this spin, and so on. And then there would be another event because the, the, the waves come along different paths. So they take different travel times. They would arrive at different times. But then by studying the, the uh, properties of this, these waves that come and inferring their masses and spins, we would be able to say, aha, these are very likely a lensed event. And um, there are no events that everybody agrees are lensed events, but it's certainly a hot debate going on uh, about you know, who's going to find one of these first. Now I have a question related to this because, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, um, when we look at uh, gravitational lens produce, uh, I mean, of the light, we can see where the light comes from, right? But for gravitational um, lens, uh, gravitational wave events, we don't know exactly where the source is, right? Or it's very hard to identify it just because we have not, not so many detectors, right? Yes. Uh, do you expect in the future to change? I mean, well, yes. Yeah. So the 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 way that we know what part of the sky the source is in um, right now relies on the fact that depending where the source is, the waves arrive at the various detectors on the Earth at slightly different times, right? Because one detector, you know, the Earth is round, and one detector is over here, and one is over here, so the waves arrive, and we can kind of infer very crudely. Uh, where they are on the sky. But the localization isn't very good right now. Uh, but as more gravitational wave detectors get built, so for example, besides the two LIGO detectors that I mentioned, there's another detector called Virgo, which is in Italy. Um, there is a new one called Kagra, which is a Japanese one, which just came online fairly recently. There's going to be another LIGO detector in India that should start in um, operating in a few years. So once you have a network around the world, you can do a much better job of localizing where the source was. And so once you have enough accuracy, then you can play the same game that you do with electromagnetic lenses, namely uh, make a, um, you know, identify the lensing galaxy that's responsible for this by the position of those images. What about LISA? Yeah, so, so, so LISA or LISA as the Americans say. Okay, I, I don't know how to pronounce yeah, well, it. We, we just, <laughs> Sorry, my um, non-native uh, No, no, you shouldn't ap accent. Ap apologize for that. I mean, LISA is now, LISA is Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. Mm -hmm. And this is a proposal to put uh, gravitational wave detectors in space to put them roughly half a million miles apart. And because they're so far apart, you're detecting very long wavelength gravitational waves produced by supermassive black holes, which are predicted also to merge when galaxies merge. So this would be a whole new window on the sky. And the, the, this is actually a real proposal. It's gonna cost, uh, I don't know, a few billion dollars. Um, NASA was going to be the lead agency. NASA got cold feet, partly because of James Webb, uh, the cost overruns on the James Webb telescope, but we won't talk about that. Um, and so Lisa got canceled by NASA, but the European Space Agency uh, took it over. And now NASA has rejoined as a junior partner and the plan is to launch this in 2034. So this will be a really exciting day for uh, gravitational wave astronomy. Uh, the sensitivity will be um, you know, much better. We'll get really pre precision measurements uh, of these waveforms. We'll really be able to answer the question, you know, was Einstein right? Will, if there's some deviations from Einstein's theory, will Lisa was going to answer that for us. 
I have a related question. Since you were describing the new detectors that are coming online in addition to the two LIGO detectors between Virgo and Cagra and LIGO India, and that it will help localize the actual uh, mergers in space and on the sky. But during your presentation, you discussed a little bit about the polarization of the gravitational waves themselves. Yes. And it seemed like, so the LIGO detectors are just a big L, right? It's a big right, right angled, you know, two laser uh, arms. Are they oriented aligned with each other? Or, I mean, obviously they're on the surface of the earth and the surface of the earth is yeah. not a plane. Um, right. Although they're both in North America, which is close <laughs> enough to a plane right. perhaps. Are they aligned uh, together or are they intentionally offset to be able to figure out polarization of the gravitational right. So when, when they were originally designed, um, we didn't know for sure that they were going to be strong signals. And so the, the designers of LIGO deliberately were very conservative. They optimized things to make a detection. Maximize the chance of getting a detection exactly. at all, and regardless the, of breaking it down into the- That's computer. right. And so they, the, the Ls are very closely aligned. Actually, if you want to be precise, because of the, the, the landscape on which they were actually built and where the properties were, they're actually 180 degrees twisted, but basically they're sensitive to the same polarization. I see, okay. Uh, but, but Virgo has a different orientation. So with Virgo, when it reaches the same sensitivity as LIGO, you'll be, you'll be much more sensitive to be able to get all of the polarization information. And that helps a lot in uh, distinguishing the positions on the sky. Does it help with other things? Does determining the polarization of the gravitational wave help with other things than just localizing and figuring out more of the distribution of the original two black holes yeah. and what their masses were and that sort of thing? Yeah, yes, so, so the fact that there are only two polarizations is a prediction of Einstein's theory. But there are proposals for, you know, everyone wants to be famous and show that Einstein <laughs> is wrong, right? So there are lots of what, we'll, what we'll, we'll call beyond general relativity theories. And they typically predict additional polarization states. So one of the goals uh, of this field over the next few years is when we have enough detectors with different sensitivities and so on to either discover that there are other polarization states or to say they're not there. I see, okay. That's very intriguing. Uh, all right. Related to the question of gravitational lensing that we just had, um, Pedro Castellano Macias asks, Regarding gravitational lensing, why is an Einstein ring formed instead of a whole disk? So just to make sure our audience is familiar with the idea of an Einstein ring, it was kind of alluded to. That's when you have, um, let's say that bright background star that I'm kind of pointing at here, the light is traveling outward away from it and some of it's coming towards, towards the camera, towards your eye. And if there's a more massive, like a massive object in between us and that object, the light will kind of lens around it. And as was described, sometimes you'll just see individual, like you'll see a dot here that's that star being lensed and then a dot over here that's that star being lensed. But you can get a ring if it's a very, you know, symmetric situation where all the light is kind of bending around it and you'll have a nice little ring. So I guess the question is, why don't you have a full disk of material instead of just that ring? Well, it's, it's because as Cameron described, what you're seeing is these light rays which get focused to make an image in front and any light ray that tried to fill in the disc, um, right, it has to go through the intervening matter that's, that's the, you know, the lens, the galaxy. And so that gets blocked out. And it's absorbed you see, or scattered yeah, or something. Right, yeah. and so all you see is, is what comes around. Indeed. Okay. Sorry, there's so many questions. <laughs> it's great. They're all very good questions. 
Um, lots of compliments to the panelists on their, their clear explanation. So good job, panelists. Uh, there was a good one. So Luna Watanabe also asks, Cos the cosmic web was mentioned earlier. What the heck is the cosmic web? Sophia, since this is the, this is the, you know, one of the major aspects of your research, would you care to explain? Yeah, um, the cosmic web is basically the whole. It's how the whole universe looks like on a very, very large scale. So I, I was mentioning that uh, we believe that galaxies were like island universes in the sense that they were isolated. So when we look through the telescopes, yeah, we only see those lights. Mm -hmm. But because of um, very smart theoreticians and because we did simulations of the universe from the beginning of the Big Bang towards our days, we realized meanwhile the universe was expanding and uh, gravitation started to attract matter. Uh, the way the matter collapsed started to form a structure that started to collapse in all the three dimensions. So it creates kind of sheets of material and filaments of material and the intersection of the filaments or like the nodes of these uh, fila filaments are the densest part of the universe. And those are the parts in which the matter can actually collapse to form stars and to form galaxies. So th the cosmic web is this whole like three dimensional structure that I was mentioned that is formed thanks to gravity and it evolves thanks to the expansion of the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, so the galaxies where we live are just the nodes of this large scale structure. And most, actually most of the matter of the universe is not in the galaxies, is in, within this web uh, structure. I hope that answers the question. I'm just gonna help a little bit and show some visual mm -hmm. aids that I find particularly helpful for this. So. Mm -hmm. Hopefully people can see my screen. This is the result of a very famous computer simulation um, called the Millennium Simulation. It was conducted primarily by Volker Springle, a German astrophysicist um, and, and his team of researchers. I think this result was came out 15 years or so ago, maybe it's it's been been a while, but um, but this is a, a simulation showing the distribution of matter, as Sophia was describing, the distribution of matter in a large representative chunk of the universe. And the regions of yellow or orange are where there's more matter, and the regions of darker colors like this black or, or dark purple are where there's less matter. So you might naively think that the distribution of matter in the universe, that, that is where the galaxies are or the clusters of galaxies are, would just be kind of randomly spread out. But that's not the case. It looks, as you can see, kind of web-like. I mean, not like a spider web per se, but, but certainly in this, as, as Sophia was describing, like filamentary structures. And so this is the result of a simulation, but to show um, the result of, a, of, a, of an observational thing, this is, so I'm just, pulling this up on the fly. This is from the, the 2DF galaxy survey. Each, each dot in this represents the location of a galaxy. We're here in the center, the earth and the, and the solar system is in the center. And we were just measuring uh, kind of out in a plane, out away from us where all the different galaxies were. Each point is a galaxy. And you can see that it has that same sort of structure that's predicted by the computer simulation that really shows that that computer simulation is able to kind of reproduce the total distribution of, of stuff in the universe in this kind of weird and structured way. So, sorry, I didn't mean to step on your feet there, Sophia, but I no, found it's, the visual- Thank the you visual for the visual aids. Helps. Yeah, <laughs> definitely helps. Um, but great, great explanation. Okay, so, ah, I, lost my, I lost my questions here. Um, And the James Webb Space Telescope, will it be able to detect biosignatures on exoplanets? Will it be able to detect either like, and I, I need to think about this. Will it be able to detect like uh, the presence of organic molecules or any other kind of biosignatures outside of our solar system? I actually don't know. I don't, 
is James Webb meant to do any direct direct detection of planets, or is it om- is it is there a coronagraph on board for being able to do direct detection of planets to block out the light from the star so you can just see the exoplanets? I don't know. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure about um, specifically the direct imaging side of James Webb, but one of the ways that it could make detections of it sounds like there's a little bit of an echo. Um, perhaps Sophia, is your? I'll turn down my sound. Maybe I'm too loud here. Sophia, can you turn down? Your sound? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. But yeah, so one of the ways that James, the James Webb Telescope, could potentially characterize the atmospheres of planets is what we call the is transit spectroscopy. So if you look at a planet as it's transiting in front of a star um, in different wavelengths the size of the planet can actually vary depending on if there's any strong absorption by any specific species at that wavelength. So for example, methane, um, water, uh, and carbon monoxide all have different wavelengths at which they are strongly absorbing. Uh, so if you are able to actually look at the planets transiting in these specific wavelengths, the size of the planet is going to appear bigger or smaller based on if these materials are present in their atmosphere. Um, so that is one way that we can actually figure out what the composition of a planetary atmosphere is. And one of these ways that we could potentially detect uh, what we call biosignatures, which are um, these types of species of chemicals that we think originate only through biological processes. Um, so an examples of some of these include um, uh, oxygen, which on Earth we think is produced by life, um, phosphine, which is a little bit of a controversial one now due to the recent discovery of phosphine on Venus. Um, methane can also be um, thought of as a biosignature depending on the amount of it that's in the atmosphere. But yeah, so there's a long list of these potential biosignatures that people have proposed and some of them have been since debunked uh, that we could potentially find in the atmospheres of these planets using JWST. And that's like Earth-like life forms, right? Because we don't really know. We have only one sample of life. We don't know how different they can be, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, that's the other thing is we don't really know what other life forms in other worlds could be producing um, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, what al- alternative chemical processes could be going on in these atmospheres that we just... It's interesting, together. yeah, because last week I was listening to a talk about uh, other ways to estimate life and not only li- li- uh, Earth life, but it's basically based on how complex or how capable are life forms to modify their own atmosphere, their own planets. And that can be independent of like, I don't know, particular um, compositions of Earth-like forms, right? Can just based on how complex the atmosphere of a planet is and and then can tell us if there is life or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are a handful of questions here regarding uh, well, from Eric Schwarzenbach asking, do we have any proof that we're, we ourselves and the universe in which we sit don't sit inside the event horizon of some sort of larger structure um, and potentially this, the cosmic microwave background could be some sort of uh, spectral signature of what we might see inside of a, of a black hole's event horizon? Um, is there is there anything consistent or inconsistent about that kind of hypothesis? I suppose you're going to make me answer that one. Yeah, I I, I hope <laughs> to. <laughs> so so, um, a, you know, a, a problem in physics. I mean, a fundamental problem is um, trying to make statements about things that we could never hope to measure. And a lot of physicists are sort of hard-nosed about this. And they'll say, oh, don't bother me with that question. That's not physics. It's metaphysics, right? Mm -hmm. Beyond physics. Um, And uh, the question of whether we are, whether our universe is actually, you know, inside a black hole or, or something like that, or maybe it's not a black hole, but, you know, there's some multiverse out there, some other you know, bigger structure that we're just a little part of and so on. And, and it's very hard with the limited tools that we have to try to give an answer to that question. We, you know, to even answer the question of how would we know whether this was true or not? 
And so, you know, I think for, for sort of an everyday physicist doing physics, physics, you know, even someone doing something as esoteric, uh, you know, as me with black holes and things like that. Um, the, these questions, you know, they're kind of things that, you know, we're humans, so we think about them. But from the point of view of really trying to answer them, they're way beyond the limited tools that physics gives us today. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of the best we can do. But I, we can do a little better on the microwave background. Um, the microwave background is almost certainly not something to do with us living inside some black hole or something like that. Um, if you just take the, 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 the Big Bang model of the universe, which has a whole bunch of uh, experimental confirmation, I mean, in a way that whole cosmic web picture is a, is a confirmation when you look in detail at the statistics of the clumping and the filaments and the sheets and the the intersections that make the galaxies. That's a prediction of the Big Bang model in detail following the gravity and the expansion and, and so on. Well, another prediction is if you start with a very um, compressed universe that's expanding, then it was very hot early on. And when the universe expands, it cools down. And when it cools to a low enough temperature, the protons and electrons, instead of being separated, will join together and make hydrogen atoms. And when you do that, the radiation in the universe, the, the, the heat from the universe that travels as electromagnetic radiation, suddenly the universe becomes transparent because you've removed all those charges, all those electrons that were scattering the radiation. And if you work it out in detail, you will see the microwave background. And we have very firm, not just the fact of the microwave background, but even its fluctuations, its little deviations from being perfectly uniform, all agree with the theory. So it's almost certainly true that we understand the microwave background and it's not some interior of a black hole. Excellent. That was, that was a, I like, I like how you handled that question. That was very good. Um, I think, so we're drawing to an end here, but I think there's one, one last question that I'm actually really interested to kind of discuss this as well. And that is, um, you know, we've learned a lot about the universe from electromagnetic waves from light traveling from distant objects. Most of the things that we observe in the sky, we can't actually travel to except for the nearest planets um, in our own solar system. And so we've learned a great deal about, about the universe from visible wavelength light, uh, X-rays, radio waves, uh, microwaves, and so on and so forth. With the advent of, of the discovery of gravitational waves, are do you think and this is for everyone really, do you think that there are other, this is basically a new window on the universe uh, that we can now see in this other method. Do you think it, it may reveal, or what do you think it may reveal about the nature of the universe? I guess maybe it's hard to predict, but one of the proposed questions from uh, Sue J.R. in the chat is, uh, will the, the merger of black holes and the, the gravitational waves that come from them could that possibly lead to the detection of the elusive dark matter that you know we've been invoking for the last 60 years or so 70 years or so do you think that there's a possibility that gravitational waves will will render some sort of additional way to to see those or to to constrain that in some capacity it seems like it could potentially um, because if you have, you know, the distribution of different particle sizes throughout the intervening space between some sort of gravitational wave signal and us, it seems like it would be a very faint, uh, signal, but it would affect the transmission of the gravitational waves through that medium, wouldn't it? Or would it not? Well, it would in principle, however, the gravitational interaction is so weak. Hmm. 
Um, you know, that's why we struggle to actually detect the waves in the first, in the first place. place. Yeah. Yes. So in a sense, the universe is essentially transparent hmm. um, to the waves. So that would be very hard effect to do. Um, we're certainly going to learn a lot from about um, interesting things about the, you know, the, the, the statistics of the universe, you know, the population of galaxies, um, you know, what's the origin of these black holes that LIGO is seeing when there are lots, there's lots of debate about where they come from, what mechanisms, how they form. And, and eventually, we, I think we'll get good answers to that, but it's going to tell us a lot about the dynamics inside galaxies. And with supermassive black holes, the dynamics of galaxy interactions with each other and so on. So we're gonna learn, I think, a lot of uh, questions which have been the purview of traditional astronomy um, by having this other window. Um, but but you know, I, I can't even imagine what kinds of other things people will come up with. I don't know if Sophia or Judy have any uh, thoughts on what we might learn in this way. Seems like it might, yeah, it might have implications for the work that that you do, you and I do, Sophia, in terms of the more massive structures in the universe. But, but I think it's going to be a ways until we can deduce things about exoplanetary systems. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, they're not and, particularly but, massive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although I guess any objects, any massive object traveling through space time will create a gravitational wave disturbance. It's just whether or not it's of any kind of intensity that we can, we can measure it. No, you, need, you need sort of at least solar mass objects traveling at close to the speed of light to that's have hard. a hope of that's detecting a, it from Earth. That's pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, I think that's a good place to stop. Thank you. To all of our panelists, uh, thank you for all of your contributions. This was, this was wonderful. And in particular, thank you, uh, Dr. Tukolsky. This was uh, really a, a wonderful presentation. And, and I'm personally really excited because I got to ask a lot of questions that were on my mind too. So, um, and uh, thank you to our audience for sticking around for a couple of hours. Hopefully you guys, I wasn't able to get to all of the, the wonderful uh, questions that you guys uh, put into the chat, but hopefully we got a pretty decent subsample of them answered or at least discussed. I encourage people to check out some of our other events. Uh, we have recordings of our last six years of events on YouTube from these stargazing lectures that happen once a month, as well as our astronomy on tap. So there's a lot of good content there um, on a variety of different topics. So, so check it out if you get a chance. And then um, our next event, as I mentioned at the beginning, we will have an astronomy on tap that will be two weeks from Monday. Um, it will not be in person yet, be mainly because the speakers that I'm getting, uh, one lives in Portland and the other, I think, lives in New York, and they won't be able to join us here in Pasadena. But um, I'm looking in May to be able to potentially return to in-person events for those. And hopefully May, we will also start having the stargazing lectures in person as well, but I will do everything I can to continue to record them and either have them live streamed or record them and put them on YouTube. So those of you who can't be present uh, in the real world can still partake and, and participate in these events. So thanks everyone uh, for your help and, and uh, for listening and we'll check in with you in a couple of weeks.